Shalom. This week's Torah portion is Parshat Mishpatim, beginning in chapter 21 of the book of Exodus. The word Mishpatim means laws, and our portion begins with God's words to Moshe, these are the laws that you shall place before them. That's exactly what we have in our portion. Laws, laws, and more laws. Detailed and comprehensive, general and specific, all relating to the challenges faced by human beings living together in a family, in a community, and in a society. So open up your heart. There's a very dramatic change taking place here. Until this week's portion, Torah has essentially been presented to us in story form. From creation in Eden, to the flood, to the patriarchs, to Joseph and his brothers and Egyptian exile, to the ten plagues and the great miracles of the Exodus, to Moshe, right up to last week's portion of Yitro, focusing on the glorious and totally ethereal experience of the Sinai revelation when God gave the Torah to Israel. And we know that these are not simply stories, but the true and actual telling of our own lives, transmitted through a divine frequency that challenges us to align our own spiritual energies with the path of free choice that God opens up before us. Now it's true that throughout Torah's narrative until here, here and there, interspersed in previous portions, God did reveal some commandments along the way. There were some commandments that had been given, but they were always secondary to the plot. They stem from the storyline. Now, with this Torah reading of Mishpatim, the drama of the narrative comes to a full stop and we encounter an entirely new style of teaching, a list of rules, mitzvot, called in English commandments. Specifically, our portion presents a list of 53 commandments, almost a tenth of the total 613 mitzvot found in the Torah. So it seems that in one fell swoop, we descend, so to speak, from such a lofty, sublime height to the minutia of everyday life with a list of laws for solving problems and dealing with the stuff of life that we face here in this very material world. The portion begins with the concept of a Hebrew servant and continues with a wide range of topics, providing divine guidance for a variety of situation. One who hits or curses one's mother or father, the concept of punishment in measure for measure, which does not literally mean an eye for an eye, but refers to one's obligation to, to provide monetary compensation for causing another person damage. There's restitution of lost property, the commandment to help even one's enemy, to stay away from anything dishonest. The list is long. The portion continues with the commandment pertaining to the three pilgrimage festivals and the great promise of the inheritance of the land. And the portion concludes back at Mount Sinai once again with Moshe's ascent to the mountain. But actually, open up your heart, it doesn't conclude back at Mount Sinai because we've never left Mount Sinai. Pay attention to what's happening here. At the climax of the story of the Sinai revelation, with the giving of the Ten Commandments, Torah interrupted itself and inserted this portion of Mishpatim with its long list. And the portion concludes by bringing us back once again to Mount Sinai. That is, by jarring us with the realization of what's been in front of us all throughout the Parsha the whole time. The portion concludes with the story of Moses' ascent to the mount as we read in chapter 24 in its last verses. Moshe ascended the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of Hashem rested upon Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for a six-day period. He called to Moshe on the seventh day from the midst of the cloud. The appearance of Hashem was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop before the eyes of the children of Israel. Moshe arrived in the midst of the cloud and ascended the mountain, and Moshe was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. So Moshe ascends to Mount Sinai to receive the Luchot HaBrit, the tablets of the law, and he remains there for 40 days and 40 nights while God is teaching him the details and practical applications of all the commandments. The teaching that God gave over to Moshe during this period, explaining to him every detail of the entire Torah, this is part of the Torah known as the, Torah, as the oral tradition. So open up your heart in the deepest way. Here we are in the midst of the story of the giving of the Torah, which was begun last week in the portion of Yitro. Why does Torah choose to interrupt the narrative in the middle and insert, and insert the portion of Mishpatim right here? Is it kind of a letdown? I mean, we are witnessing divine revelation, the most transcendent experience in human history, literally proof of God, and in the middle of this awe-inspiring, magnificent event in which all the boundaries of the limitations of human existence were lifted, 
and what was thought of to be reality was shown to be the real illusion, an encounter in which the very senses were liberated from their constraints. So that as we read in chapter 20 and verse 21, the entire people saw the thunder. And now in the midst of it all, we are given civil laws. Civil laws meaning laws pertaining to bondsmen, to watchmen, to bodily injury, to damage caused to another person, and payments and murder and manslaughter and seduction, to damage caused to another person by animals, to an ox that gores. But the most amazing thing of all, as we ask this question, is that we realize that all this is coming from the mouth of God himself. These are his instructions. These are the details that concern him as the nation of Israel is still standing at Mount Sinai. What does this tell us about the nature of these laws? What does this tell us about God's priorities and how important these laws are to him? You know, some people think that God is in heaven and he couldn't care less about the details of our lives. But Torah teaches that nothing could be further from the truth. God is in the details of how a person chooses to live their life. Our portion begins with the letter Vav attached to the word mishpatim, meaning and these are the laws, ve'ela ha-mishpatim. The letter vav works like the word and in English, and Rashi teaches that it appears here to add on to what was previously stated. And so here in the portion's first sentence, and these are the laws, means that just as the Ten Commandments in the previous portion were given at Mount Sinai, so too all of these civil laws are of divine origin. They're all included in the Torah given at Sinai. And this is why our portion appears in the midst of the saga of Mount Sinai, so that we understand the sanctity of these divine ordinances. The letter Vav connects Mount Sinai to our everyday life. So open up your heart deeper still. What is Torah law really all about? Living with these mishpatim in a day-to-day -day life is a manifestation of the deepest level of emunah, of faith in Hashem. The laws, the judicial system of other nations, are a rational product of human intellect. Agree or disagree, it's somebody's opinion of right and wrong. It's man-made. Torah testifies and teaches that its laws were all given at the sign of revelation, and thus we believe that all these laws are in an integral and inseparable part of God's word. And this is so deep, because this means that the laws of Hashem and adherence to them is an aspect of declaring faith in Hashem our affirmation that he is the creator and his word alone defines justice. Therefore, the sages teach us, every judge who issues a correct ruling in Torah law becomes a partner in God's act of creation. And when three judges sit together to decide a ruling, the Shekhinah, the divine presence, is among them and guides them. Our sages teach that God's purpose in creating the world was his desire to have an abode below, here in this lowly world. And as we shall see over the coming weeks, the remainder of the book of Exodus is chiefly occupied with achieving this goal. Now that Israel has been redeemed from Egypt and gifted with Torah, the nation's goal will be the building of the tabernacle, later to become the holy temple, there to welcome the divine presence into this world. But even before we begin those portions that center on the building of the tabernacle, we find this secret expressed right here in our Parshat Mishpatim as well. In the words of the holy Nitivot Shalom, this is why the Holy One, blessed be He, gave us the portion of Mishpatim, so that, living as we are in the midst of this world of falsehood, we should know how to conduct ourselves according to God's laws of truth. Parshat Mishpatim is about the details, and it's precisely in the small details of our lives, in our interactions with our fellow man, that our partnership with the Creator is best expressed. Through these commandments, we're enjoined to channel the light of divine wisdom into the material reality, into the darkness of our world. This is how we create an abode, a dwelling place for the divine presence here on earth. Torah does not leave even one small detail of human affairs unaddressed. And because the lengthy exile has taken its toll on our minds and hearts, because the immorality and godlessness of our world has seeped into our brains and corrupted our thinking process, disconnecting us from the truth of our relationship to Hashem and His Torah, because of this, some of these mitzvot are difficult for us to understand at first, but they're part of an enriching program for living, and each one needs to be studied in great detail to understand their practical application in our world today, bearing in mind that God took a people out of Egypt, presented them with His way of life, 
and is preparing to bring them into his land, whereupon he desires for them to form his model society to be an example to the world. We need to approach this study with faith in Hashem and recognition that the conflict resolution and the solution to such problems and disputes and societal abuses symbolized by those mentioned in our Parsha is only found by connecting to the light of the Torah, by bringing the truth of Hashem into the place of darkness. So open up your heart in the very deepest way. The very first commandment with which our Parshat Mishpatim begins is the concept of the Hebrew servant. In Hebrew, Evid Ivri. But of all things, why did Torah choose to begin this section of laws that were uttered at Sinai with the law of a Hebrew servant? And what is an Evid Ivri? An Evid Ivri is a Jewish individual who becomes a bondsman or servant to another Jewish person. There are two main scenarios in which a person might become such a servant. The first scenario is when a person steals and is unable to repay the stolen goods. In such a case, if the thief is caught and brought before a court, the court may rule that the thief becomes a servant for a limited period of time to work off their debt. The second scenario is when a person is in dire financial straits or personal difficulties and is unable to support themselves or their family. In this case, the person may voluntarily choose this period of temporary servitude to alleviate their economic hardship. In either case, the individual is given the opportunity to work towards improving themselves, and in either case, the master is obligated to provide the servant with his necessities and treat him with dignity and kindness, providing for their needs. Now, in modern-day prisons, individuals are incarcerated and subjected to harsh conditions, exposed to worse ways than they knew before, sinking deeper into hopelessness and despair so that upon leaving, oftentimes they are left with no alternative but to pursue a life of crime. Torah recognizes that people can make mistakes and fall into difficult circumstances, and it provides a framework for their rehabilitation and reintegration into society. Maimonides explains how all of the rules governing over how this servant is to be treated with dignity and care are aspects of great mercy. The master is commanded to provide the evidivri with the same quality of food and clothing and shelter that he himself enjoys. The servant can't be given inferior or substandard provisions and the master is commanded to care for this person as he would a member of his own family, and indeed, to treat him even better than he treats himself. For example, if the master only has one pillow, the sages of the Talmud instruct that the master must provide it for the servant. If the master mistreats the servant, the servant has the right to be released immediately, and the master is also required to provide the servant with the necessary tools and resources to learn how to earn a livelihood enabling him a second chance to eventually regain his independence. This environment of care and guidance allows the Evid Ivri to learn and grow, both personally and professionally. And during their time as a servant, the individual has the chance to acquire new skills, learn from their experiences, and develop a sense of responsibility. And he can only serve for a maximum of six years, and in the seventh year he must be set free, unless he willingly chooses to remain in servitude. But this is not a perpetual cycle of servitude. The attribute of mercy is the foundation of everything. It is the most important measure of a man and Torah's main objective in man's adherence to the commandments. And this is precisely why Torah begins this portion of Mishpatim with the concept of the Hebrew servant. A master's relationship with such a person is his given opportunity, his God-given opportunity, his personal tikkun to aid him, himself, to acquire and internalize the attributes of compassion and kindness. Because without rachmanut, the attribute of mercy, without the ability to feel empathy for another person, there is no hope whatsoever for any person to ever become a functioning member of the society that Torah envisions, one that's based on caring for each other. But once an individual has truly developed this trait of compassion, it will naturally follow that it will be easier for him to refrain from committing the other sins that the Torah warns about as the Parsha continues, because a great deal of the ability to cautiously avoid doing evil is dependent on the attribute of compassion. Look, a merciful person doesn't hurt others. He doesn't bear false witness. He doesn't covet someone else's property. He won't refrain from returning a lost article. He's careful not to cause others damage and everything else that follows in the Parsha. As the great sage known as Hillel the, Al the Hillel the Elder taught, 
What is hateful to you, don't do to someone else. Hillel was a scholar of great renown who lived in this era of the Second Temple, who taught the importance of empathy and the importance of treating others with compassion and kindness and respect. This is called Hillel's Golden Rule. The Talmud relates the famous story of a non-Jew who approached Hillel and challenged him to teach him the entire Torah while standing on one foot. In response and with great patience, Hillel stood on one foot and he said, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Go and study it. This is the core principle of the Torah, to treat others with kindness and respect. Hillel encouraged the man to study the Torah further, to gain a deeper understanding of its teachings and how they can be applied in daily life. The vastness, the vastness of Torah's many laws and commandments is rooted in Hashem's desire to instill within us love, compassion, and ethical behavior towards others. It encourages us to go way beyond mere knowledge and actively apply these principles in our interactions with others, building and shaping our own personal character while building a caring and responsible society. The Sinai revelation takes us from spiritual immaturity to become partners in creation, imbuing the material world with the truth of Hashem. Thank you for watching this week's Jerusalem Lights Torah portion. Jerusalem Lights exists to share Torah for everyone and exists only through your support. We appreciate your partnership, which enables this outreach to continue and grow. Shabbat Shalom.